So welcome to seminar today. Our speaker is Dr. Dale Johnson. He's a farm management specialist, and I've been told to keep it short and sweet, and he'll, he'll take it over uh, for the rest of the introduction for himself. Actually, I'm not a doctor. I only have a master's degree, but that's fine. I was raised on the desert of Idaho, and uh, it truly is a desert. If you don't irrigate it, there, it, all it grows is sagebrush out there, and it's at the west, all of the west. And so right now, every morning, the first thing I do when I wake up is I look at the sun reports in California, Utah, Nevada, Idaho. That's what excites me. So you can tell how boring my life is for pieces of a better year. Alpha and Brighton ski resorts in Utah, where I've skied many times, both have exceeded 800 inches of snow this year. That's record, 800 inches, 67 feet of snow. But of course, they really need it because the Salt Lake is about dried up. But OK, I'm off on a tangent already, and I got to step to the topic. Uh, I've worked since, here since 1985, um, and I do e economics and management education programs for farmers, and I teach two courses on campus. Um, a futures marketing course and a farm management course, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today. And I worked or toured in 30 countries, including eight former Soviet republics. And I'm just devastated by what's going on between Ukraine and Russia because I work in both countries. And it's just devastating what's going on there. And this is, I'm going to talk about several things, but this is the main thing I'm going to talk about sand dams in Kenya. And if you have never heard of sand dams, neither did I before I went to Kenya last fall. But <laughs> yes, I got to click here. <laughs> All right. Um, I teach AREC 306 Farm Management and Sustainable Food Production. This course is about agriculture, economics, management, and sustainability. And uh, actually, it's a catch all. I used to teach kids that were going back to the farm. I don't do that anymore. So it's just whatever I want to teach. And AREC seems to be okay with it. Uh, but let me let me give some short definitions of these four topics that I cover. Agriculture, production of calories, protein, vitamins, minerals, and fiber to satisfy hunger and taste buds for billions of people. That's a short definition. Economics and management, how humans use scarce resources to satisfy their wants and needs. That's a standard definition for economics. But management is closely related. And sustainability, here's how I sum it up. Will the food, and I'm talking about agricultural sustainability here, will the food production system feed my grandchildren's grandchildren? I take the long view. Now that's not very useful because I have no idea what's gonna happen in my children's life or my grandchildren's life. I mean, things have got to change dramatically. And, and I have no idea, so, so I take the long view, but it doesn't do me any good because I have no idea what it's gonna be like. But I wanna talk about, um, um, a little bit about these scarce resources in my class. I talk about the scarce resources, we're talking about agricultural sustainability, talk about the scarce resources of soils, fossil fuels, water, and mine fertilizer. I kind of think these are the critical scarce, there's a lot of scarce resources. These are the critical scarce resources and that could dis really disrupt our food production systems so that we don't have enough to feed 8 billion or 9 billion or 10 billion or 15 billion people in my grandchildren's lifetime. Uh, so my first question, what other major scarce resource am I missing? Is there, I mean, this is a useful question. I, am I missing a major scarce resource that's going to disrupt our food production systems? Or if I got it there? Yes. Pardon me? So, scientists. That's, that's, that's an interesting yes, maybe so. Okay. Any others? I'm talking about natural, natural, natural resources, but that's useful. Crop diversity. Um, I think, I'm, I'm, again, I'm talking about the actual resources, the, you know, the, you know, what, what this earth has, what this earth has to contribute. Um, that's what we air, have to do. Air. 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 Well, and I, mm -hmm. that could be a scarce resource. Maybe in China, that's a scarce resource with the pollution and with the air pollution and so forth. Yes. Uh, I tended not to think is that a scarce resource because we seem to have plenty of it. But in some places, maybe that is a problem. Uh, yeah. Let's look at these four, four, uh, four 
resources. Which do you, uh, by a show of hands, which do you think is the most scarce resource in the short term we're talking in the next 25 years or so? Soils, raise your hand. None. Fossil fuels, raise your hand. Okay. Mine fertilizers. Okay. Few there. And water. Yeah, I believe it's water. Again, I've got a slanted viewpoint because without that snowpack in the Idaho mountains, we would have never grown potatoes. So yeah, water. And as I have traveled around the world and seen the aquifers drying up, seeing the glacier waters drying up and the global climate change and now all kinds of things going on with water. And sometimes it could be a big problem, too much water, but most of the time it's not enough water. I think it's water in the short term. I'm not so sure about the long term because, because maybe we're gonna figure out uh, economical, I'm an economist, we gotta have economical ways of desalinating the water, okay? And maybe we'll come up with that. So maybe it's not so big, in, uh, maybe we're gonna to learn to manage it better for the, okay, how about the long term? Long term, soils. I'm talking about uh, 200 years here, soils, okay? And I think that's an easy one to think about because with, with 2 billion more people, 3 billion more people, we're gonna have space for them. So maybe we're gonna run out of soils. How about fossil fuels? Okay, I mean, a few years ago, we would, everybody would thought, oh, it's gonna be fossil fuels because when we run out of fossil fuels, we're in trouble. I think we're showing that we're finding alternatives there. And uh, water, I think we're gonna figure that out in the long term. Uh, mine fertilizers. I mean, I, I can't figure out this mine fertilizer business. We have about two to 300 years worth of mine for, of, of fertilizer reserves. I mean, plants have to have potassium and phosphorus. We'll figure out the nitrogen, but the plant potassium and phosphorus. And once we take that, those stores of phosphorus and potassium and we spread them all around, around and they end up in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Pacific Ocean, where are we going to get it from? So I don't know about that one. This is really not that. Um, great of a, a useful discussion, but it, it, it's a little bit interesting. Okay, but what I'm going to focus on today is water. And oh, so my background for what I'm going to say is um, I taught at Daystar University last fall. Very, I've been to 30 countries. I think I saved the best for last. It was just really exciting. And then I'm going to conduct a study abroad program. Uh, too late, you can't get into it for this year, but next year. Uh, uh, we're going to have an exciting program this summer in June. Okay, so what I want to talk about is sand dams. I didn't know anything about sand dams before I went to uh, um, Kenya. And these sand dams are sustainable water systems for communities and farmers. All right, and I understand Kenya because it's, it's desert. It's, they call it semi-arid. The reason it's semi-arid is they've got two rainy seasons. But the rest of the year, there is not a drop. And those two rainy seasons, the water just washes through. And it's like, they, I mean, mostly it's desert because during the rainy season, those soils don't, there's no good places to, to store the water and so forth. So these sand dams are just very interesting to me to see how they're, they're um, making their living circumstances sustainable in the long term by capturing that water. And um, these, Across the country, these sand dams are built by what they call community-based organizations, CBOs, uh, local people getting together and saying, we have to improve our situation because we're in trouble, okay? And so this is a grassroots level. And grassroots CBOs go to the government and say, we want to put some sand dams in on this river where all the water washes through. And so the government regulates it to make sure they're in the right spots and they don't put too many in and all of these things. And then the government also provides them with the engineer to do, you gotta have an engineer to, to help them do it. The rebar, metal, the metal rebar that they need for the dam, the wire, cement, and wooden forms. The government provides that. The community provides the labor water and the community collects the sand. The sand is right there. There is sand in those riverbeds on top of that bedrock. Okay, so they just collect the sand and you're going to see how we do that, how they did that and that and they have to collect the rock. Okay, and so the communities provide the human re power to do all this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a video 
of my friend Joshua talking. I first talked to, I first worked with Joshua right before COVID when I was working on a dairy farm in Kenya. Joshua and I had become good friends. Joshua was on a wealthy farm in Africa. It was about 80 acres. That's wealthy in, in Kenya. Had to have 80 acres, okay? And his father sent him to school in, uh, in New Jersey. He went to Rutgers. And uh, his story is very interesting coming over here with nothing in his pocket. He ended up staying here in the United States for 20 years and kind of making his fortune, his own fortune here in the United States. Now he's gone back and he's back to his family farm and, he's, and his goal is to help the local people. He's a mover and a shaker. And uh, we've, we've become very good friends. We're the exact same age within a month of each other. And both of us just have this shared vision of what can happen to these communities over there. So I'm gonna show you a video and he's gonna talk about these, he's gonna talk about these uh, uh, sand dams and explain them. And I'm gonna pitch in a little bit and explain them too. And it's just a little bit long video, but, but um, I really enjoy it. I mean, I just, he's one of my good friends. So I just like listening to him. So let's hope this works out now. about some of the people that you can see the video and you know who are uh, we are from uh, this region of Kenya. This area is called Makrani County. It's about what uh, three hours it's considered as a semi arid uh, area because of the nature of the way sorry about the wind in the background. We don't receive a lot of rain, but we can see the cloud rain to do our farming. Uh, and also, uh, after now, what I mean, water for irrigation and for all the other areas. One of the main, main, main areas in uh, our province is water. And water has become uh, an issue not only in the country, but also in and we came together as a community to find out how do we uh, uh, capture water? How do we capture water? Because the, the problem is not the water, the problem is the soil. And we get enough rain, but through that rain and water, that water is washed from upstream river or the river. So we came together as a community and we uh, registered and we want to talk to the legislature. We want to send your community state. The purpose of that CPO was to address two issues. Number two, uh, environmental conservation. And number three, we address the uh, issue of uh, water storage, water, uh, water uh, use. So uh, we sat down and we asked ourselves, what do we need? Uh, what do we need to do as a community to be able uh, to increase the amount of water that we have? So we decided that one of the best ways to do is to do that alongside the river side. We have this uh, river that is here, it's called the Mutili River. And we said we are going to uh, so the center in this way so that. Uh, to capture the water so that the water needs so we approach a non-profit organization that helps communities to be sent down called the African uh, Sandal Foundation. We have been working us for the next ten years to do one dam every year because we're going to be five years. This dam we started we started collecting the materials for this dam. Uh, what part, what the partnership between us and the Sundown Foundation uh, uh, entails is that the community has to collect the stones, the sand, and the water for construction, and then they provide the land. The organization, which is Sundown Foundation, they are responsible for being a, being a, technic, a, a technical person who is going to, going to, go to work with us to stop the dam. Number two, to bring and buy for us a cement, if you are happy 
this. Number, number three, uh, we brought all the uh, steel that we put here. So we got together, we started we, from, from uh, at, uh, I think from October. We raised the money, collected enough stone, we collected enough sand, and we were ready by the October. And then they came, they brought us about a thousand men. And they did that design. So the beginning of uh, the beginning of the we are here every day, Monday to Saturday, five to four. Uh, and then it was so fortunate that we took care of it for seven days. And now, here we are, the same down is full, and uh, water is on the floor. And uh, we are looking forward to using this water for uh, domestic uh, consumption, livestock, and uh, this meeting. We are doing exactly on the fishery here, and the project is a pilot project. It's very good. Now, uh, we, also, we are also uh, uh, approaching partners working us to approach the project. Uh, they are doing the same thing, they are the same thing again of uh, Africa, they are willing to work with us. Uh, we are also working by Sina. Uh, he has been very helpful in working with us. Uh, we are also looking at the uh, other areas. Uh, so, a lot of our stories. Uh, the story of the land, uh, this thing is called the land here. We have a population of about 15,000. The average of the land is the land here. One is the last one. The dollar is the same as the dollar. Using our uh, different projects for the community. So that is a story, and I like to also there to add a bit more what the Sandown has and how it works. And I want to be able to point this. This whole project has been absolutely fascinating to me because Joshua and Jennifer invited us here in August, and we walked the dry riverbed, and they said, We're going to put a dam down here. And we kind of understood what they were doing, but it's like hard to envision it. Then we came back in October, and there they were building the dam, 60 people building the dam uh, with the materials that they had gathered over the months. And it was absolutely fascinating to watch 60 people build a dam in 19 days. Uh, we came that one day, and I actually did some shoveling of sand. <laughs> but it, it was just fascinating watching the community get together and build the dam. And, and even then, I didn't understand the full concept of how these things work. I'm going to jump down. <laughs> okay. It's called a sand dam because eventually this thing is going to fill with sand. And you think, okay, if it fills with sand, it's no more, it's, it's useless because you can't put water in it. Well, sand. You can sand it, the 35% of the volume can contain water. So even after it fills up with sand a few years from now, 35% of that volume of sand will contain water. And what's going to happen then is the water filters into the well right there from the sand, and they will be able to pump the water from the sand to that pump right there, and they will still be able to use it. It won't have to be as much water as it is now, but there's still water there. So that's why they're called sand dams. So it's a very interesting technology to me. The, 
Because originally, I didn't know it's like they're called sand dance because they will fill up the sand, but you'll still have all that one. So it's great technology. It's very fortunate that Leanne is holding a camera, and I have been able to meet Joshua and Jennifer and see what they're doing in this community. And uh, there's a lot of like minded people in the community who want to lift their income up. A dollar a day is not very much money. <laughs> they need five dollars a day. And that's what we're trying to do in bringing enterprises, poultry enterprises, layer, broiler, fishery enterprises, using the water and other and crop enterprises. We can use this water for people's life better. So thank you for the, th the three stages we have seen. The beginning stage when we had a river bank. Exactly. exactly. The second stage is the most fascinating. <laughs> Watching people build a bank. Now the third stage we came today, it's full. <laughs> it's just it's, it's one of the most exciting things I've seen here in Kenya. Uh, you know, I've seen everything in Kenya. You know, I've seen every animal. I've seen, I've seen, I've sailed mountains. I went surfing in the Indian Ocean. This is the most fascinating thing I've seen in Kenya. <laughs> so, all right, that's the story. And you are not again, you and great friends. I invite what I love better is what we are trying to do with climate change. We are all about climate change, um, making life, uh, making life better, you know, one life at a time, one community at a time. So please, you are welcome to take the next step anytime. Thank you. And um, yes, hopefully next summer, I'm bringing students here from the University of Maryland mm -hmm. here so they can see what's going on here. They need to see this. So uh, I'm actually talking maybe to some of you students who are watching this video now. Hopefully you will come and see this in person next summer. Okay. And by the time you come next summer, there will be more and more activities that are taking place that you will see and uh, really excited. So thanks soon. Well, thank, thank you. you. It, she she wore the hat. I didn't tell her to put the hat on. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's how the sand dam works. So in the rainy season, the water just washes through there. And you say, well, you know, if they capture, what about the people downstream? They're not, well, there's plenty of water that they're not getting. And eventually they can only put so many sand dams on a river. Otherwise, the people downstream will not have enough water. But but they've got plenty of water. 97 to 90% of the water still gets by. I mean, you could see that sand dam wasn't all that big. But for a small community, that was a significant amount of water when they are struggling to get enough water. Okay, so that's how it works. And um, the rainy season and then the dry season, and you saw the well that they had put in. They did not have a tap here on their on their dam here. Okay, and they uh, and they're going to focus on or they're going to use that well. They're not going to have a scoop hole in theirs. Um, but that's how it works, and it was so exciting to see it, as I mentioned in the video, August, they carefully look, um, uh, chose the location of the dam. It's on, it's on Joshua's property. And uh, they have to look at a place where there, the, there will be structural integrity. There has to be bedrock. You gotta put the rebar in, put the, the dam in place, maximize storage reservoir capacity. They are small. So you gotta try and get as much sand and water behind that dam as you can, because they're not big. Uh, and uh, there has to be river bedrock. Otherwise, the, the, the water is going to percolate down, down and out of the sand. Okay, so it's got to it, it's got to be on bedrock. So the conditions have to be right. But on those rivers in Kenya, there are many places where the conditions are right that they can put these sand dams in. The rock and the sand are collected by the community, and we're just showing how. I'm not help, actually helping here. We're just showing how they did it. They have they have gurneys, stretchers. And one by one, those people hauled these rocks into place. Many of these rocks are, are now broken up. These are too big, and they're going to break them up. They need to be smaller. 
okay? And sand, they just scoop the sand off. There's a lot of sand on the riverbed. That's not a big problem. And through wheelbarrows, they take the sand. So they have big piles of sand and rock uh, waiting for them. And then in, it, was at, it was late September, or early October, the community builds the dam with shovels and wheelbarrows. That's it. That's all they had. 60 people in three weeks. One of the most exciting things that I've seen in my life. It's like, if I have to say, okay, I want to relive Italy or Germany or Kazakhstan, Moscow. No, I want, I'd like to go back here again. This was exciting. So watch this. 60 people. I did, I did help out. <laughs> and I kept, there, there were some women shoveling with me and they were just going at it. And I'm 66 years old. And I just, like, Josh, you couldn't save me. I, I'm going to die here. You know, because I have too much pride to quit. I was just hoping Josh was going to come by and say, Dale, we got to go, go somewhere else. But he didn't. So I, I did it all afternoon. And, that, and I, when I was through, I felt great. It was just great to do that. And um, uh, the resources going into this, dam, into this dam are valuable. At the end of it, every day, they count the nails. They count the rebar. They count the wire. Now, for lunch, what happens is uh, these women here provide lunch, a big kettle over a huge kettle over an open fire with corn mash and sugar and water. And that's it. It's corn gruel for lunch for all these people. They count the resources. One time they came up a pound short of sugar. And Joshua says, what, what happened to the pound of sugar? And one of the older women stole a pound of sugar. And these are valuable resources. And he, had, he made her get up in front of everybody and apologize. He says, we can't be stealing these resources. We got to have them here. And that's how, much, how important these resources are and how they count them. So uh, uh, right here, the men would line up here, and here's a big heap of, con of uh, concrete, cement, sand, and gravel, and each person would shovel 20 shovels over the, over the top, and they're throwing the, con the, the concrete over here, 20 shovelfuls, and then you're, you're beat. That's it. You go to the back of the line to rest, and then the next person, 20 shovels, and you're beat. I didn't get in that line. I could, I could not have put 20 shovelfuls of concrete over that over the top of that. I wish I could have done it, but I just, could, I knew I, if I get up there, I'm going to get one shovel and it's going to splatter all over the side. So, so I, I, I didn't get in that line. So, Dale, I have a so this is a dry river, but how much of the year is it actually rough? How much of the year before the dam is there actually water running into? There's two, two, two rainy seasons in the fall. The rainy season is, um, is October, November. And in the spring, there's three months in the, uh, April, May, April, May, and June. Okay, but the, the rains come in in torrential rains. And uh, within a day, that river's not flowing anymore. It just washes down and it's not flowing anymore. Okay, yeah. I mean, they just, it just washes right down. There's a lot of rain, but it just torrential comes and washes right through. So these, 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 are, these, these rivers probably run just a few days out of the year. Okay, and then in then in uh, November we went back and we got to see it full. Okay, and uh, that was just so exciting to see that um, full of water and the potential that they have for that. Any questions about sand dams? So when it when it like in relative to like how cold it's like I'm just trying to think of like how long does the water last in the sand dam right like how long do you have water? Uh, yeah. That all depends on how many people are going to draw out. Right. Okay. So and and you know I um we can can't, can't calculate the acre feet of water in there because it's about all right we could actually probably do it right now we're not going to take the time but that's probably it goes up probably about three acres, three acres. And it's, um, you can see how deep it is. And they're actually gonna raise the level of this too. So it's really not that much water, okay? And it all depends on how many people are going to uh, uh, draw the water out of it. It, you know, the first rain probably came down and filled it a quarter, quarter of the way. And then a week later, another torrential rain and it filled pretty fast, okay? And then the future, well, the Ovilini Central CBO, that's the organization of these people. Um, they're going to build four more of these dams, a couple of them on Joshua's property, and then on up the river. 
They're going to build, so they're going to have five dams for the community of people. I would say probably a thousand people are going to benefit from the five dams. Okay. And it's going to be used, and, and that water is going to be rationed out very carefully, very carefully, just like the sugar was rationed out. Okay. It's going to be used for households because right now they have to buy water, and um, water is just is the scarce resource. And, they're going to, and I thought, what on earth they're going to put fisheries in? This is desert. But no, they can, uh, they've got, they can put things over the surface of the water so it's not, there's not very much evaporation. And they're going to put tilapia and catfish ponds in, a pond maybe uh, not quite the size of this room, small in this room, just enough to earn these people three to ten dollars a day. Okay, that's a huge fortune for them to earn three to ten dollars a day off of a small fish pond. Okay, or uh, a small scale broiler or layer operation that. Joshua and I are trying to put on these existing farms. You know, a hundred broilers or uh, six or seven blocks a year, or a hundred layers will get them three dollars a day. You know, if they if it's a good farm and they can handle five hundred, that'll get them fifteen dollars a day in income. Okay. And if they want to fat, if they want to put in three thousand birds because they can, they've got the resources. Well, that's your business. That's not what we're about. You know, we're about trying to help the subsistence farmers. And then drip irrigation for oil and feed crops, sunflower. They're going to grow sunflower for the oil, and then that, of course, the oil, sunflower oil meal, sunflower meal is a good protein feed for the, for the, the these broilers and for the fish. And uh, more, uh, a more, more emphasis on sorghum, sunflower and sorghum, drought resistance crop, and, and uh, drip irrigation to uh, grow those crops. I think I'm just about through with sand beds. Any more questions about sand beds? Yes. Yeah, very good. Yes, the sand is a filter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, they tell me that's what it looks like all the time. Now, I was on another farm and they had another reservoir like this. And I saw two Maasai women come from the Maasai tribe. And that, that's one of the most famous tribes that we've all seen in Africa. Two Maasai women came down with, um, with, um, 20 liter jugs and they got their water for the day and it, the water looked like this. And I, and we asked them, I said, now do you filter these? Oh yeah, we run it, we run it, run it through fabric to get that sand out. Okay, but it's, it probably still, I mean, there's a lot of suspended clay in there and they're just gonna drink it. You know, that's the way they do it. Any other question I saw on the hand? Yes, yes, because, you know, when it, when this completely fills up, this is going to be sand right here. Okay. It's not going to evaporate. Once the, once the water is suspended in that sand, it's not going to evaporate. I mean, you know, yeah, you get that top six inches of sand where it's going to dry out, but that's going to help out a lot. And then in some of them, you can see that they actually plant plants in there. Okay. Plant plants don't take a lot, but they don't want the plants to take all the water. They're not going to put any deep rooted plants in there to take all that water. But plants on the surface that are going to um, form a barrier, at, you know, then they're going to die in the dry, dry season, but they form a barrier for the evaporation. I saw one more hand. Yes. Down to get unknown by after the uh, system, right? Like, is this something effective for these types of dams? Pardon me? Is there going to have some effect uh, in, in the ecosystem? In the ecosystem. I mean, they're so small that there's not a big effect. Now, locally, locally, in this just little area right here, that's a, they changed the ecosystem of that little area right there. It's three to four acres. Okay. But it makes it nice because, you know, there is a place where there's water there. And uh, I'm at, maybe think of one more thing. Oh, finally, I realized, you know, this is, we're not making the sand and we're making an aquifer. This is just a little aquifer. That's a, a, a more interesting way to characterize it. Any other questions about saying that? Yes. I guess um, just to touch on the fishery ponds are going to be that's going to be somewhere else. Right. The fisheries are going to be right next to these ponds. The people who own the land right next to these ponds are going to put the fisheries in. And of course they're going to they're going to regulate those very closely. They're not going to put very many of them because that takes, you know, a pond half the size of this room does take a considerable amount of water when you consider how big these are. Okay. But uh, they can grow a lot of catfish and plenty in those ponds. They stock them heavy. They can grow it, and that's really great protein to them. Okay.
So I'm going to uh, switch gears just a little bit. So talk about my study abroad program in Kenya. So some of you might want to go in 2024, if it worked out in 23. <laughs> I think it's going, I have my students. I, I think it's going to be a great program. Um, the, 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 it is sponsored by AREC, Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. And Jonathan Moyle, who some of you know, poultry specialist is going to accompany me because there is going to be some focus on poultry in, in this class and some of the projects he and I are working on with Joshua and Daystar University, which is hosting us there. And that's where I uh, work. And it's too bad that you didn't get in this fall. The cost is $2,300, but I got everybody a $1,500 scholarship. So this is pretty cheap to go to Kenya for less for about $4,000. Uh, it's going to be a great experience. And some of the things we're going to do is you complete the AREC 306, Farm Management and Sustainable Food Production. It is a scholarship and practice course. So that it gets, and there's no prerequisites. And I have to cater the course and where the students going, the interests of the students going. I mean, when you're talking about agriculture, economics, management, and sustainability, you can really manipulate this course to, this, to, to whatever people want to learn. Interact with Daystar students and the local community for immersion in Kenya culture. Learn about Kenya agriculture through field trips to Kenya farms. We're going to go to Joshua's farm. What we're going to do is we're going to go to Joshua's farm. He's got a, I told you, he's got a quite, quite a large farm, so, uh, 80 acres with he and his family. He's putting in a rig boiler operation, which is going to be separate, separate from the project we're working on. And he grows all kinds of vegetables and fruit, livestock. He's got a fascinating farm. Then we're going to stay overnight in, in local homes, which is a humbling experience. And then the next day, we're going to help build uh, help build the sand dam. Uh, so, yes, I'm going to shovel sand again. Uh, and I'll just try to swallow my pride when I have to quit. Uh, we're going to hike the Lukenia Plateau. Outside Daystar University, there was this mountain. And I just thought, my wife, I thought, we got to get up there. But one day we got found, we found Felix, who you'll hear about later, and he took us up on top. It's not a mountain. It was a plateau. Okay. And there were herds of zebras and little beasts, giraffes up there. It was just, and they were all wild. They're not like Nairobi National Park where we're going to go, where you can drive the giraffes and the rhinoceroses don't care about oil land cruisers. They see them all the time. Up on top of this plateau, those animals, you couldn't get within 100, 200 yards or they'd start running, which I like. It's like these animals are wild. <laughs> you know, they're not used to being around humans. So I like being out where the wild animals are. But we are going to uh, Nairobi National Park where you're going to see almost everything except elephants. It's not big enough for elephants. I think we might see elephants in, in Sable National Park. Remember? I think we're going to be driving through there and we might see elephants. We're going to see almost everything in National in at Nairobi National Park, and we're going to go to the Giraffe Center, and this is maybe crude, but you can French get the most giraffe if you want. Yeah, and I always wondered, how do giraffes eat acacia trees? I've seen them gobble up these two-inch two thorns off the ends. How do they do it? Well, you learn, those tongues are like leather. And I'm sure one of their thorns are like leather too. It's just amazing how they can eat those acacia thorns. And uh, we're going to go to the elephant orphanage, cult Nairobi cultural hotspot. And we're going to go to Mombasa to visit the, the Portuguese fortress and snorkel in the Indian Ocean. So doesn't that sound like a great trip? Let's tell other students about it. Uh, everybody's welcome. Graduate students are welcome. So next June, for you that didn't make it in this year. All right. How much time have we got? Yes. How was it um, working with the study abroad office and setting this up? And what are, if somebody's interested in doing something like this, what are some tips? The to study abroad office is just terrific. I mean, their job is to get these programs going. The university wants them all over the all over the world. And I said, okay, we got ten students to make this work. Well, John, John Moyle and I got it down. That we got four students going, and it's going to work. Study abroad office, and of course, John and I had to really. Uh, give in a lot on some, some things to make this financially work. <laughs> no, we're paying our own way over there. Okay. But um, the city boss is just terrific. And they know a lot of stuff. And, I, and I'm a little worried about taking students over. It's like, you know, 
it's kind of, it's not it's not an easy place over there. But the study brought it just terrific compass. And they sent you to everything. But now if you want it for next year, the, the deadline already passed. But if you want to do a study brought next for next year, you go and say, I really got this idea. They're gonna take it even though the deadline's passed. I mean, the deadline for this year was last summer. And in December, I said I want to do this in Kenya, and they brought it to me. I have time for this. Subsistence farms. I got time for this. So subsistence farms dominate agriculture in Kenya. They're less than five acres for a family. Now, if it's five acres, it's usually uh, two or three generations of family. That's a big farm, five acres. Okay. Maybe a medium size or normal size farm is two to three acres. All right. They grow maize, potatoes, sugar cane, fruits and vegetables. It's subsistence. They, they live off of this land. They have a few cattle, goats, and chickens for protein. Uh, most of it is for personal consumption. Dollar a day is, in itself is common. You know, under five hundred dollars a year in income. They they simply don't have any purchased things. They, you know, they just grow their food. They purchase some clothes, or they probably purchase materials and then hand sew some clothes. No money for inputs or capital improvements. Women are an important source of management labor on these farms because it, it, in Kenya, it is easier for men to find jobs than women. And so the women take over these farms. Most of these, these CBOs, the community-based organizations, 70 to 80% of the membership is women. These women get together and say, we got we to do better here. We got to help each other out. We got to learn from each other. And they're very good managers. So it's exciting to watch them work together. So... What we're trying to do is we want to establish small-scale agriculture, agriculture enterprises on these subsistence farms. We want to increase their income three to $15 a day. Like I said, 100 layers will get you $3 a day. I'm an economist, <laughs> we worked work all this out. 500 layers will get you $15 a day. A pond of tilapia catfish will get you $5 a day, $5, $10 a day, depending, depending on the size of the pond. We're going to create jobs through produ pro uh, producing, processing, and marketing products. Uh, adopt drought, drought tolerant crops, specifically sorghum and sunflower. We need to get more of those, more sorghum and sunflower into those for feed crops for these enterprises. And the oil from the sunflower is, is a high value uh, product. And particularly focused on farms that are operated by women. We're focusing on the farms that need it the most, but also have the resources to do it. Okay. And of course, they, 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 I don't understand it, but they're importing pult, uh, bro, uh, poultry meats and they're importing eggs. They don't need to. From Uganda, Tanzania, they can do it themselves. And so we're going to get local uh, poultry products and um, aquaculture products into the, consumer, into the consumers. So uh, we're going to develop the markets for this stuff. And then I just kind of talked about all this. We're, we're going to build on they're, they're, this particular organization is building, going to build four, uh, four more dams, one each year. Okay. And uh, we established these small scale enterprises that the, commu the, uh, the community based organization complex. There's going to be a complex which will be to have the abattoir, the slaughterhouse, for processing the birds and the fish, feed processing plant where we bring in the sorghum, sunflower, and other um, L, uh, crops and uh, sort of sort feed sources, and we're going to make it a good quality feed. You know, we're going to try to balance the feed for the poultry and for the, the fish. And of course, this organization has got to um, develop the markets, and it's going to going to be good for the local merchants because it's like here's a local source that we can depend on. Eggs are going to be rolling in every day. Fish is going to roll in every day. And um, poultry meat is going to roll in every day. We can depend on them. And then we're going to train farmers in improved production methods. Daystar University and the University of Maryland is going to help conduct education programs for the farmers. And of course, they have a good expertise there too. Daystar University is just developing an agriculture program and John Moyle and I are, are helping them develop the agriculture program there. Hopefully they're going to be able to provide education for the farmers. And I'm getting, getting down there. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, I'm going to finish up. Uh, somebody asked me if I would talk about my encounter with the leopard. 
Okay, so I will tell you about the, the experience that I had with, these, with this leopard. Okay. Fresh killed zebra. Was it a leopard or a hyena? That's one of the most interesting things I've seen in my life. The, bull, the, the blood was still pulled right in this, here in this zebra. Uh, Felix, our game uh, uh, guide game warden, he's a really good friend of mine now. Uh, couldn't tell for sure. But as we proceeded down the narrow trail, Felix gripped his walking stick with both hands. Leanne and I, my wife, Leanne and I had humorously rehearsed what to do if attacked. But in real life, instinct kicks in. As the trail widened, there it was, a young leopard crouched down, as startled by us as we are of it. Instinctively, I pulled out my Leatherman and opened the blade, the only weapon I had. The cat, too, relied on instinct. Fight or flight. In a flash, I was on my back, the beast on top of me forelegs around me with claws digging into my back. As its gaping mouth approached my head, my left hand crammed my binoculars into that horrifying cavern. Its jaws clamped tight on the binoculars, shattering teeth, but also tearing flesh on my fingers to the bone. As it opened its mouth, I shoved the binoculars deeper. Its gagging reflex elicited a tighter grip from its paws and I could feel its claws ripping through the flesh and muscle of my back. With a leather man in my right hand, I flailed wildly at the side of the cat, every other stroke penetrating, but a three inch blade was not going to go hit any vitals and I could tell I was fighting a losing battle. With a fling of its head, binoculars went flying and I braced for a death grip from its mouth. As suddenly it started, the animal was off of me and bounding through the brush. I lay there exhausted, emotionally as much as physically. I knew the numbness of my wounds would soon turn, uh, would soon turn to pain. I took stock of my injuries, blood, flowed profusely from my left hand that I had sacrificed. My little finger and thumb were broken. The tip of my ring finger was gone, bone protruding out the end. My wrist felt jammed. I sat up and I could feel the deep gashes in my back, my shirt torn and wet with sticky blood. Leanne and Felix were tending to me. What happened? Why am I alive? While I was in a fight to the death, Felix had been stabbing at the cat with his walking stick, but to no avail. Finally, instinct took over Felix and he put the stick into the groin of the male leopard to save my life. Thank you, Felix. Curiously, I asked Leanne what she had been doing. She told me she'd been pulling on the leg of the animal, just like I am pulling on yours. <laughs> Now, that experience really did happen in my mind. <laughs> After I saw that zebra all the way down the trail and back to the university, I lived every moment of that attack in my mind. I could feel it. I could envision it. I could feel it. And you could tell I, I experienced that in my mind. Thank heavens it wasn't my own. It wasn't uh, real. <laughs> Uh, let me see. I think that's it. Any questions? Oh, I, I could do the rhinoceros attack too. <laughs> the Rosmer rhinoceros attack is more believable. Yeah. Yes. Pardon me? The government. The, the government dictates uh, how many sand dams can be in and, and generally where they're going to go. Joshua talked about the Sand Dam Foundation. It's actually a quasi government agency. Okay, it's very well connected to the government. 
but it, it, but it, it also gets a lot of resources, uh, Bill Gates Foundation, and so forth. Okay, so and I think it does get some government money, but the but the government ultimately determines how many how many sand ends you can get put in because, yeah, you know, on one of these big rivers you could put in a hundred sand dams. We got to make sure that they still get the water downstream too, because that, that that water is used during those short periods of time. So, any other questions? Uh, Dale, this is Adele. I am. Can I ask question from Zoom? Yes, just a minute. I got. I got one question here about okay. Feed, okay. Uh, feeds. And right now they feed. They feed. All right. They grow maize, and and um, maize is the is the primary crop right now that they feed them. But but actually, on these subsistence farms, these chickens are running around the yard. Okay, they're not feeding them anything. You might throw them a little bit of corn, corn uh, ground corn. Okay, and they're not feeding them anything. Now, there are a few ponds in there, and those ponds are where university people are helping them put them in, and they're, tr and they're doing a little bit of feed formulation, okay? I mean, so, and they're just taking the local uh, ingredients that they, that they have to try to have some formulation to feed. But right now, there's not much feed formulation. It's just, you know, whatever you got there, that's what you're gonna feed them. That's what we wanna try and improve. You know, get better, more drought, drought tolerant crops, increase yields, get crops where we can get some protein, better protein and calories into those animals. What was the question from Zoom? Yes, that, that's me, Adele. Hi, Dale. Uh, hey, uh, what a great experience. Thank you for this excellent presentation. And, uh, you know, one thing that sort of uh, struck my, my interest was the drip irrigation. And looking at the water uh, behind the sand dam, Looking brown, I was wondering if they have for future plan for drip irrigation, what would be the potential for emitters being plugged by the, you know, suspended solids and particulates and so on, using that kind of water? Or the, are, were there any plans sort of filter it out? Um, if it passes through the sand dam, some of it, I'm sure it can filter that out, but then that has to be stored and pumped into the system. Anyway, that was that was something came to my mind. Plus, you know, how how can they afford drip irrigation as an initial investment? Does government actually help with that with that aspect of it? Excellent question. Because first of all, it's got to be drip irrigation because you saw the side of the side of the sand dam. It's not that much water. So if we got to water sunflower and sorghum, which are drought, uh, you know, they don't need a lot of water, but they got to have water. So it's got to be drip irrigation. Now the drip irrigation could be drip, 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 okay? Because the, there's plenty of labor, okay? Because we, there's not gonna be the resources to put what we call drip irrigation in with tubes and, and, and spigots and so forth. You know, uh, and with their type of drip irrigation from a, from a kettle, you don't even need to filter it. So, we have to think in terms of drip irrigation in Africa. It's very different than drip irrigation here, but that's what it's got to be. I mean, you give every plant the precise amount it needs that week or that few period, few days, so you're maximizing every drip of that water. Any other questions? Yes. So I think one that that uh, maybe someone's trying to get at is the idea. There's been an arrangement to build a dam. Now there's some water. Uh, and there's a lot of people interested in using it. Mm -hmm. How do the decisions get made at that point? Is yes. Go to aquaculture, which is water intensive, or some of these. Very other good. And that's where you, you go back to these community based organizations. And usually these community based, community based organizations are formed by some people who are, are dynamic, charismatic, and they organize. I'll give you the example here Uvalini, uh, a central community based organization. Uh, about 100 people in this organization, about 70 to 80 of them are women. Joshua's leading it up. They all get together. It's very much a democracy. And, and now Joshua says, you know, I'm going to furnish the land. This is on my land, but we're going to help the local community. How, who's going to get this? Okay. How, uh, it's going to be the community-based organizations. And the government recognizes community-based organizations. They went to the Sandan Foundation and said, here's a community-based organization. This is the village. These people are all um, uh, of one mind of what we want to do. This, there's going to be some conflicts. It's like some person's not going to end up with chickens that want them. It's like you're not ready for them yet. 
you know, you just simply don't have the resources to do this, or we've got to do it. So it, it, there's going to be hard decisions. So, so uh, you need a little bit of democracy and a little bit of a benevolent dictator to make sure that all this works out. But this through these community-based organizations, that they're doing this across the country. 